students and our leadership. At this time, I am so incredibly excited to introduce you to Bird Running Water, our keynote address speaker. Bird Running Water belongs to the Cheyenne and Mescalero Apache Tribal Nations and was raised on the Mescalero Apache Reservation in New Mexico. He is a producer and, exec and executive producer for film and television and most recently signed a first look deal to create content with Amazon Studios. Prior to launching his career, Running Water guided the Sundance Institute's commitment to indigenous filmmakers for 20 years, nurturing new generations of filmmakers through the Institute's Labs and Science and Sundance Film Festival. He also served as the head of the Institute's diversity equity and inclusion work institute wide. And what is not in here, but what I do know from reading his other bio, he has mentored and nurtured over 95 filmmakers, brought over 100 plus films into, uh, into our viewing pleasure, and has made sure that we have had large representation in cinema and on TV and mainstream. Running Water is a member of the Academy of Motion Pictures and Sciences. That means he gets to influence the Academy Awards. He is a graduate of the University of Oklahoma with degrees in journalism and Native American studies. And he received his Master of Public Affairs degree from the University of Texas at Austin at, Austin, at Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs. Please help me welcome to the stage, Bird Running Water. I was fine until they said 2,700 people. Um, so forgive me, <laughs> I'm a little nervous. Um, I do know that um, I have some relatives in here from both of my tribes, so I just wanted to at least say to them, uh, I wanted to um, also pay my respects to the Kuwia people, the Agua Caliente tribe. Thank you for allowing us to be on your beautiful homelands. I love the heat, personally. Um, I keep wanting to sit outside and just soak it all in. But I just think, I just have to acknowledge, you know, first of all, like how amazing is it as, for us to kind of all gather like this. When I first thought of coming, I guess, really to one of my first big Indian national conferences, not big Indians, but, you know, large <laughs> conferences, um, I immediately thought of the Antis episode from Reservation Dogs. <laughs> how many of you have seen that one? Yeah. But um, so, gentlemen, beware. Um, my next thoughts when I was asked to give this address was what am I going to say to all of these brilliant, beautiful minds in the STEM world, both emerging students, professionals, educators, because, you know, I secretly, I always wanted to be one of you, um, but I was weeded out at a very early stage. I'm someone who consistently made C minuses and much worse in all of my math and science courses, all the way through my educational experience, from high school to college to grad school. I think it's a miracle that I even, you know, graduated at all. Um, when I first started out at the University of Oklahoma, I declared engineering my major. Um, but, I think like Lillian, um, my, after my first year GPA of 1.2, um, <laughs> I kind of had to find another major that I thought might, you know, kind of agree with me. Um, so I ended up following another path, you know, and I went down this road of receiving two degrees in journalism and Native American studies from OU. I got a fellowship from the Woodrow Wilson Foundation to go to grad school to study public policy, where I graduated with a degree and master's degree in public policy, public affairs. And at that point, my intention was, I want to go out into the education world. I want to create, you know, culturally relevant education models in our, you know, in our education systems, you know. But again, 
the path changed. I ended up working uh, my first job out of grad school running the global funding portfolio for media at the Ford Foundation, uh, funding projects and non-commercial work in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and Russia, you know, as a 26-year-old living in New York City, which was an amazing time to be in New York City in the 90s. Some of you weren't even born then. <laughs> Actually, I think I have clothes older than most of you. Um, <laughs> But, you know, uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, I, I, I ended up on this path after Ford. I worked for the, one of the Rockefeller family members, and then I ended up at Sundance Institute heading up, you know, an indigenous film division um, of an organization founded by Robert Redford, who some of you generationally may not know again. Um, <laughs> But he is a benevolent um, ally to our community. You know, he wanted to uplift, you know, basically the invisible voices of Native peoples, Native Americans and indigenous peoples in our world of cinema. And I was given that charge under the Sundance banner to do for 20 years. <laughs> You know, it's a space that I never even envisioned. It's a place that I never even dreamed that, you know, that coming from growing up on the Mescalero Apache Reservation in southern New Mexico, graduating from Clinton High School in western Oklahoma, where my mother's tribe is, that I would end up, you know, on this career path, let alone kind of the places that I, that I stand in. But, you know, one of the things that I had to draw upon when, upon arriving at Sundance, I didn't know what the heck I was going to do. But thankfully, I was given essentially kind of a, a, a free reign to really kind of to design for impact. And so one of the things I had to draw upon was, yes, my educational knowledge and experience, but also, you know, my cultural knowledge. And that's when I first began re, uh, redesigning the program and then also designing you know, labs and mentorships, um, you know, really kind of centering indigenous thought and culture as a way of, you know, really trying to nurture filmmakers from really, uh, from the US, from Canada, Australia, New Zealand, the circumpolar Arctic, and Latin America. And so the program I ran was a global indigenous program. And so many of the first charges I wanted was to build a global indigenous film community. And it was very, Thankfully, of all of that risk, my life was at stake. Um, but, you know, I had an inkling. I was like, why don't, let's try this and see what could happen. Given my training um, in our Mescalero traditions of singing our girls into womanhood through our coming of age ceremonies, one of the first things that I began to use as a metaphor for design was, uh, was kind of using that framework as, you know, to uh, apply to our lab model of encompassing, you know, the notion of four days where, you know, a ceremony of spiritual and physical transitions are nurtured and guided and held with great sanctity. And that was the thrust of the work that I did for 20 years, working with global filmmakers to transition them into an industry where most often we weren't even really known or understood. Two of the very first artists I work with, worked with when I first started at Sundance were Sterlin Harjo and Taika Waititi. They are the co-creators of the Reservation Dog series that many of you may have seen on Hulu. Um, and this was after Taika directed you know, the first of two Thor movies, the Thor Ragnarok film, um, and is now part of the Thor franchise in the Marvel Universe. Um, and this was also, you know, I worked with him before he won his Oscar for Jojo Rabbit, uh, where he won Best Adapted Screenplay. And so, you know, I just have to say, like, with not only, there's only those, those are only two of many artists, a slew of artists. I think there's 137 artists that I was able to shepherd through the indigenous program at Sundance. And I can guarantee you, there are so much more headed towards your screens, given, you know, our global film community, and I cannot wait. As, um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, as Lillian said, uh, you know, I, I was invited to join the Academy, the organization behind the Oscars, so I get to vote for the Oscars every year. Um, 
But one of the things I'm, you know, I'm also involved with is um, what's called our Indigenous Alliance, which is really kind of a collective of, you know, our Indigenous talent that have been invited to join the Academy. There's a, there's a handful of us. Um, but, you know, so one thing I want you guys to think about, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm also the vice chair of my branch within the academy and within my branch of what's called members at large, we have a technology section, a technology cohort within our branch. And these are all of these technologists who work on things like the Marvel Universe in the animated world and all of these other spaces that I think so many of you could, you know, would probably lend so much to. Um, one of the things I'm really proud of that I think, you know, I really drew upon on my Cheyenne side of the family. Um, I belong to our council of 44, our peace chiefs on my mother's side. And we're kind of taught to facilitate, you know, peacemaking, essentially. And one of the things that I was really a proud to able, be able to do about two weeks ago, a little more than two weeks ago, was to host a reconciliation between the Academy of Motion Pictures and Sasheen Little Feather. And those of you who may not know, you know, Sasheen Littlefeather um, graciously declined Marlon Brando's Oscar on stage at the Oscars in 1973, wearing her buckskin dress. And sadly, you know, she just passed away over this past weekend. And so, you know, so many of us are kind of, we knew it was coming. We knew that she had cancer. We knew that she was ill. She spoke about it when I interviewed her on stage at the Academy two weeks ago. You know, she said, I'm going to the spirit world soon, and I'm not afraid. And it just so reminded me of, like, my grandmother used to always say, I'm not always going to be here. You're going to have to take care of yourself. There was something very comforting, I think, in her acceptance, you know, of where she was headed next. And I'll always be grateful to, to her for that. But one of the things that she was, she and Marlon Brando were protesting in 1973 was the treatment of American Indians by the American film industry, you know, by our history of misrepresentation, you know, and the ongoing exclusion of us and our stories, you know, from an industry that really has global influence. And sadly, after she appeared on the Oscars, her acting career was squashed. She was never allowed to work again. And, you know, and so she retreated to her native community in, in the Bay Area and dedicated her life to working in that world. And, you know, she ultimately became a prime example of what she was speaking out against. Our country's tumultuous history of colonization rooted in white supremacy and inequity. All of you here are disproving so much of that history. You know, with all of the great paths that you're on, all of the great studies that you've embarked on, and even with every breath that you take today, so breathe deeply. <laughs> one, of the, one of the directors that I worked with, I met her uncle here yesterday, uh, Sydney Freeland. She is a Navajo trans woman filmmaker. Um, she just finished working on a secret series um, that may or may not be a, a, a native superhero project. I can't say. Um, but, you know, that entire production was filmed entirely on blue screen. And, you know, and it requires so much technology and so many technicians, you know, to spearhead visual effects to, from the process by which they shoot it to how it ends up on your screen. I know so many of you could probably participate in that process. I also first witnessed the high levels of technology and science being used when I visited Taika Waititi's Thor Ragnarok set when he was shooting in Australia. You know, there were so many people running around set while they were shooting with their iPads while I was watching in the director's tent on four big screens how they were shooting this stuff on blue screen with people wearing body suits with like ping pong balls all over them while they were simultaneously rendering visual effects in terms of how it would look and how it would line up to be eventually become, you know, the film Thor Ragnarok. Um, you know, 
given all of this, this is just a small one small intersection that I feel and I see, you know, between your world and my world, even though I wish I had been in your world. Um, <laughs> but ultimately, you know, I don't, some of the advice I would say was just like, be, always be aware to the signs around you. I recognize that through a lot of our Western education process, you know, we're taught that, you know, we have to achieve that one thing. We have to get that one thing. If that one thing can happen, everything's going to be okay, and then we can, you know, continue down a linear path. And, some, and I've come to find out in my own life, going back to my 1.2 GPA, um, that that was never going to happen for me. And so I really learned to open my heart, you know, to open my spirit, to really continually start my day off with my prayers, you know, for family and for all humans, and to kind of continually follow, you know, the path that was put in front of me. I was always able to draw upon, you know, as I mentioned earlier, my traditions, you know, to advocate for our native people in spaces where we had rarely been in and always being sure to bring other Native people alongside with me. I've fought for us to be treated with dignity in the same industry that rejected Sasheen Littlefeather and so many others, so many others of, of our community who really did lay down the groundwork for me to be able to step into a place to have impact, but also people who never got the chance, you know, to see their own personal visions you know, realized um, in, our, in our film and television industry. I don't know if some of you know, but you know, the organization I'm on the board of, Illuminative, did a, a major research project called, called Reclaiming Native Truth. And in the statistics they found was that 79% of Americans don't know that we exist as modern people today. I'm sure many of you feel that. Certainly our screens show that. And they also found that 80% of state educational curricula standards don't teach about us past the 1800s, and nor are we taught beyond most Americans' junior high school years. If you compound that with our on-screen representation of 0.04% of all American film and television, you know, we've ultimately been erased from American popular culture and from a lot of American minds. And so that's what, one of the things that really fuels me is to really change those numbers. And I think so many of you can have an impact on changing those numbers as well. <laughs> Just imagine what, we could ha what would happen if our film and TV communities that I work with collaborated with everyone here in the STEM world. Can you just imagine the stories that we could create, the stories that we could tell, the stories that we could make, the stories that we could put onto screens? You know, so many of the artists I've had the pleasure of working with, championing, advocating for, and a lot of times even feeding because they were so broke starting out their careers. They are now starting to shift the paradigm of not only American film and television, but global film and television. That probably wouldn't have happened if I forced a career in engineering or education policy. Maybe it would have. Um, or even what I actually studied, you know, while I was in grad school. Moving forward in my new capacity as a producer, like uh, Lillian said, I've signed a first look deal with Amazon Studios. Um, <laughs> Which again, uh, there are only four of us um, in the Native community working at this level who have studio deals. Sierra Ornelas, the creator of Rutherford Falls, which is a TV show that ran for two years. Sterling Harjo, uh, who is the co-creator and showrunner for Reservation Dogs. Michael Gray Eyes, who is a well-known actor as well. And myself. And so there's a whole new level, well, I just want to say that there's a whole new level of, of business, you know, in terms of like the systems and, 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 and the, the way that, you know, quote unquote, Hollywood works. You know, it's like we've always been like trying to perforate, you know, those boundaries of invisibility and participation. And thanks to the work, especially of, of Sierra and Sterling, 
You know, it's like they hired all native writers, they hired all native directors, they hired natives everywhere they could at every level of the production. And by doing so, they have flooded the industry with all new writers and directors that are now working on so many other shows, you know, that you're seeing on your screens now. They might not be indigenous shows, but they're being indigenous written and indigenous directed. <laughs> so that, those are kind of, those are kind of like my, my goals, my personal, you know, we have a great small community working, we share information, we cheer each other on, you know, I think gone are the days with the white supremacist thought and notion that, you know, there's only space for one because that's untrue. You know, it's like we're not competing against one another. We're actually there to help each other along the way. And also to try to indigenize the screens that we all have access to, that you all are watching. And that to me is the most excitement, exciting part. But I just wanted to, you know, kind of close with, you know, one, some of the thoughts that I always think of, there's two um, as I continue to, you know, kind of navigate this world and trying to carry on, you know, um, my Cheyenne sister, Montoya Whiteman, is here who uh, works for ASIS, Nemehot's sister. Epivawona, <laughs> um, we, we share our grandpa Henry, um, her maternal grandfather, my gra maternal grandmother's brother, Grandpa Henry. Whenever I left Clinton, Oklahoma, I packed up my car, and I don't even know where the rest of my family was. I think they went on vacation, and I had to go start college, but I was on my way. I was like, well, I'm going to go by and see Grandpa Henry. Went by, drove by his house, and um, I told him, I said, Grandpa, I'm going to college. I'm moving to Norman. He was like, oh, that's good. That's good. You know, we had a nice little chat, gave him a hug, and one of the things that he said to me was like, don't forget about us, you know. And that's something that, you know, is so difficult to do because I love my family and I love my communities and I love our native people. And everything that I do, you know, is, is a stride for, for everyone and trying to bring others alongside with me. And then also, one of the things that I think about when I remember telling my mom, you know, as I think maybe a seven-year-old or an eight-year-old, you know, talking about being bullied in school, I think it's something we've all experienced. You know, she lectured me, you know, she raised her voice and lectured me. She's like, you know, you are the grandson of a chief. Don't ever let anyone speak to you like that, you know. And it was this very early lecture of, you know, of, of how to carry myself, you know, with dignity. And one of the things that she always used to say that I think applies to all of us was carry yourself with dignity. You are the descendant of warrior people. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate you having me here. Thank you, ASIS. Have a good day. Yes. Please stand standing as we take a selfie with you.